Isn't that, is that amazing to watch three, four hundred kids just walk through those doors? That's awesome. If you have your Bibles, you can flip over to Ephesians chapter 4. And that's where we're going to end up tonight. We're finishing up a series called um, For Heaven's Sakes. And before we get to that, I just want to play a little game, okay? We're, going to, we're just going to play a little game. And I'm just going to ask a question, and you're to respond to the question, okay? And on your fingers, you should keep track of how many you get right. All right? And it's going to be really easy. First question. Who... Does God love? Good. Everybody, right? Everybody. Who does God? Let's try that one more time because you kind of were a little slow. All right, let's pretend like, hey, can you imagine letting 400 kids walk out of here? Okay, just kind of backtracking. We're going to play a little game. All right, now we're up to speed. Who does God love? Oh, you guys are smart. You'd think you've done this question before. <laughs> Who does God forgive? Everyone. 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 Who does God accept? Everyone. Everyone. Who does God show mercy to? Everyone. Everyone. One more. One more. Well, one more on this set. Who does God invite to know him through his son, Jesus Christ. Everyone. Everyone, right? Okay, now it's going to get a little bit harder. Okay, let's see if you can hang with this. It's going to get just a little bit harder. Who do you love? Oh! What was that? It was like, oh, I don't know what to say. Who do you love? Who do you forgive? Are you being honest? <laughs> Who do you accept? Yeah, this is harder, isn't it? It's like he tricked me. I came to church and he tricked me. <laughs> Who do you show mercy to? Who have you invited to know him? You see, as we finish our book study on Ephesians, this is what's going on. Paul is writing to the church of Ephesus, and he is in jail. I don't, know if, I don't know if you picked up on that, but he is in jail. And he is encouraging the church of Ephesus to live their lives in such a way that people come to know Jesus. That's the goal. The first three chapters, Paul is reminding them of their spiritual inheritance. He goes on to, to remind them of all the good things that God has given them, the spiritual inheritance that they have in Jesus. And one of the reasons he's doing that is because although the city of Ephesus was a very, very, very rich city for its time, the church of Ephesus was not. And he was saying, don't get caught up in the money game. Remember, you're in a spiritual inheritance. And so what he was doing in the very beginning was he was reminding them what they have as Christians, what they have as Christ followers. And then in chapters 4 and 5, he changes it. And he begins to remind them why they have it. See, you have a spiritual inheritance. All of us do. We all have a spiritual inheritance. And that's a wonderful thing. But you have to ask the question, why do you have it? Do you have it so that God would just make your life good and easy? No. Why do you have it? You see, as Americans, we get caught up in this notion that Jesus Christ died so that you and I could be happy. That if I'm using my gifts right, then my life should go well. That if I'm using my gifts right, then, then my life should make me happy. And then we forget that Paul is writing this book from jail. And he's using his gifts. Check out Ephesians chapter 4. 
Let me read it to you. We're going to work our way from 1 through verses uh, 16. It's up, on the script, it's up on the screens, but I really, really encourage you that it's one thing to come up and look at the Scripture. That's a great thing. But man, bring your Bibles, highlight them, write in them, dirty them up, so that when you leave here, you can say, this is what God spoke to me. He says, Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, I want to stop right there. This is complete freebie. This is over and atop, over at the top of, of what the message has to get. Therefore, I a prisoner for serving the Lord. Here's what he's saying. He's saying that he's not just a prisoner, but he chose to be a prisoner. You see, remember, Paul could have chosen not to proclaim the gospel. He could have went back to Rome and just lived as a citizen, and that him being in jail was a result of the fact that he chose to live his life in such a way that it brings honor and glory to God, no matter what the cost. So when he's saying, I am a prisoner, he's saying, I am a prisoner because I have chosen to serve the Lord, and I knew what it was going to cost me, and I paid the price. I anteed up. He says, I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. He says, be humble and gentle. Be patient, patient with each other. Make an allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Always keep yourselves united in the Holy Spirit and bind yourself together with peace. We are all one body. We have the same Spirit and we all have been called to the same glorious future. There is only one Lord one faith, one baptism, and there is only one God and Father who is over us all and in us all and living through us all. However, he has given each one of us a special gift according to the generosity of Christ. That is why scriptures say, when he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Notice that it says he ascended. This means that Christ first came down to the lowly world in which we live. The same one who came down is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens so that his rule might fill the entire universe. Verse 11. He is the one who gave these gifts to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and the teachers. Now I want you to pause for just a second because if you... Take and read it from that point of view. You would come to the conclusion that the spiritual gifts that God gave was the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. And that's not true. What he's saying is that he's given everybody spiritual gifts, and these people with these gifts, their responsibility to is, to, is to equip God's people to do his work. So he's saying that everybody has gifts, but these portion of people have the gifts that they're supposed to use to equip God's people. Okay? Where are we at? Verse 13. Until we come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son, that we will be mature and full-grown in the Lord, measuring up to the full stature of Christ. Then we will no longer be like children, forever changing our minds about what we believe. Because someone has told us something different, or because someone has cleverly lied to us and made the lie sound like the truth. Instead, we will hold to the truth in love. You see, there's a lot of Christians that hold to the truth. They just don't do it with love. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to hold to the truth. But you know what? And we're also called to hold to the truth in love. That's what we're really called to do. Becoming more and more in every way like Christ, who is the head of the body, the church. Under his direction, the whole body is fitted together perfectly. As each part does, its own special work, it helps the other parts grow. And so that the whole body, this is, this is the goal of the whole body, so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. You see, here's the very first thing that I want you to write down. I'm going to give you five steps that is going to help that, I'm going to give you five steps that will help you lead a life that honors God. That's my goal tonight. 
And the very first step I want to give you is this. For heaven's sake, lead a life worthy of your calling. For heaven's sake, lead a life worthy of your calling. Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. Now catch this. For you have been called by God. Who have you been called by? Come on, come on. It's not, it's not complicated. You have been called by God. We have been called by God. Guys, catch this. The God of all creation who created the universe, who created the earth, who breathed life and breath into you and I, is calling you. He's begging you. He's urging you to lead a life worthy of your calling. John 5, 13 and 14 makes two proclamations. The first says this. It says, you are the salt of the earth. The second says, you are the light of the world, a city on a hill. The first and second go together, and what they really mean is, you are the hope of mankind. What did God give the world? When he looked across and he said, I need to give the world my very best, what did he give the world? He gave his son Jesus, right? We all know that. We all get that. What did Jesus give the world when he looked across and said, I am going to give my very best? What did he give? We would say his life. But that's not right. What he gave the world when he gave his very best was you and I. Because you are the light of the world. You are a city on a hill. You see, it, and then there's this portion between those two scriptures, and it says something different. It says, what good is the salt if it loses its saltiness? What good is the person who is God has given his life for if they just choose not to be used? You see, we are the hope of the world. For heaven's sakes, lead a life worthy of your calling. This week I was really proud of one of my best friends, Jake Wilkinson. Jake Wilkinson, th this week, he's our middle school youth pastor and he is rocking. He is so cool. We wish we could be that cool. He can blow things up and he gets paid for it. He's a youth pastor. What better job could you have? He's at home, he looks at opens his window, and he looks across the street to his neighbor. Now, he knows his neighbor. The neighbor and his wife have no proclamation towards Christianity whatsoever. He's had conversations with them. But he did find out that his neighbor's wife had been diagnosed with cancer. And he's sitting out there, and he looks out the window, and he sees her. And he's sitting there for a second, and then this notion goes through his head. If I let her sit out on that porch without sharing the good news of Jesus and the hope of Jesus Christ to her life, what good is my Christianity? He walks across the street, and as he walks across the street, she looks up and she says, hey, what are you doing? He says, hey, I just came over to tell you I'm sorry. And he said at that moment, she completely burst, and she just started bawling. Gave him a hug, he's crying on his shoulder. He said, you know what, I'm so sorry. He said, but I want you to know there's hope. There is hope in God for your situation. There is hope in God for your life. And about that time, her husband pulled up, and she's, he's seeing his wife <laughs> crying in this other man's arms. And he's like, what is going on? She said, I was just praying for your wife. And he said he got to say, spend 45 minutes with them, just sharing the hope of the world. That's how it's supposed to work, right? You see, you don't have to wait for the audible voice of God. All you got to do is live Jesus Christ right where you're at. 
I know of a guy I don't know him personally, but he's one of my inspirations. His name is Bill Wilson. Bill Wilson has a church in Chicago that reaches over 20,000 children every week. He is the pastor of a children's church. It's not for adults, it's for kids. But what makes Bill so cool is that when Bill was eight, eight years of age, his mom and dad divorced. His mom took him down to Florida so that they would have a place to stay with his aunt. His mom looked at him and said, Bill, stay right here. Fort Lauderdale, right on the beach. Stay right here. I'm going to be back for you. I'm going to go find your aunt. And for three days, Bill stayed on that corner. Till finally, a guy walks across the street and says, hey, what's up? He says, well, my mom went to my, get my aunt, and she's going to come back for me. And the guy looked at her and said, you know, I, I've been watching you for three days. I don't think she's coming back, sir. I don't think she's coming back. He says, why don't you come with me? He ended up adopting Bill. He raised Bill in the ways of the Lord. Bill went on to become a youth pastor in California. And one day he got a friend, call from his friend who had this children's ministry in New York City. He said, Bill, I'd like for you to come out and see it. Man, every week we got a couple hundred kids that we reach out to. It's really cool. Come out and check it out. So Bill went out there and for three weeks they'd go to, pot, to manholes and knock on the manhole and say, hey guys, it's time for church. And out from the ground would come families to send their kids to church. They'd go to burned out buildings and yell in the buildings, hey guys, it's time for church. And out would come these kids for church. He stayed there for three weeks and they did this every week. Until finally it came to the day for him to leave. He had his bag, bags packed and his friend showed up and his friend had his bags packed also. And his friend looked at him and said, Bill, you're not leaving today. I'm leaving today. Because God has called you to reach these kids. Bill will tell you he never heard the audible voice of God saying, do this. See, we're waiting for God to put it on our heart exactly what we're supposed to do. Bill will tell you that the one thing that he did hear was kids who needed somebody to love them and lead them to Jesus. And now today he leads over 20,000 kids per week to know Christ and their families. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You are a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. You see, you are responsible and I am responsible for the call of God upon our life. And just because you choose not to respond doesn't mean you're not responsible. I believe that you can walk away from the call of God all day long and you will still stand before God responsible. Are you responding to the call of God in your life? You see, the second way to bring unity to the world is this. For heaven's sake, learn to make allowances for each other. For heaven's sake, learn to make allowances for each other. Verse 2 says, be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. All right, I want you to turn to your neighbor right now and look at your neighbor in the eye and say, thank God you are a big screw-up. <laughs> Go ahead, say it. Thank God you are a big screw-up. That felt pretty good, right? You guys are waiting for some holier-than-thou moment. Thank God you're a big screw-up. Now I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, and so am I. Here is the proclamation of Jesus Christ. Come as you are. It's okay. Man, some of you guys are just waiting. You're waiting for Jesus you're waiting to be cleaned up before you come to Jesus. Before you fully commit your life to Him. And He's just saying, dude, you're a screw-up. You're going to be a screw-up when you come. You're going to be a screw-up when you leave. Because that's how we're made. We're broken people. D. 
Do you know what has the power to unite people? To unite rich people and poor people. Black people and white people and red people and yellow people and brown people. Do you know what has the power to unite healthy people and sick people? It's not money. It's the love of Jesus. That's what it is. I, I was out there last week, whatever there is. I was out waiting for my booth to sign up guys for men's ministry and do that kind of thing. And as I, I slipped out just a little bit early, and as I slipped out, so did one of my friends. He had his baby stroller. He's pushing his little girl across the way there, and I said, hey, man, how's it going? He's a friend of ours. They don't come to this church, but they came to watch Jake and Sarah's baby dedication last week. And what was that? That was great. And so he's pushing his little girl across the way there, and I said, hey, Joel, good to see you, man. How's life going? He said, oh, it's great. He reaches down, and he brushes his little girl's face. I said, how's Tamara? She said, oh, Tamara's not doing very well. And he does this thing every day. He takes her and he puts her in a car seat. And he takes her from a car seat because he's a good dad. And he puts her in her baby stroller. The only difference is this. His little girl is 36 years of age. And she's never fully developed. And I have never heard him complain one day in his life. He loves his little girl. She's one year younger than I am. Do you know what unites the healthy and the sick? The love of God. God's love. That's what unites the world, guys. We want to be a world that is united to the world. We don't want to be a church to ourselves. 1 Peter 4, 8 says, Above all, love each other deeply. Because love covers a multitude of sins. You see, I believe that more people come to know Christ through love than through zeal. Gandhi said these words. He said, I'm convinced there would not be a Hindu left if Christians lived as Christ. I think that's interesting coming from a Hindu. You see, people screw up for one reason and one reason only. Because we are broken and we are screwed up. And we need to learn to love for heaven's sakes. I believe that the world is starving for a church who is humble and gentle and patient and forgiving. A church where people love each other deeply. You see, I believe the greatest opportunity that the church has is not in our worship music, which I'm glad we have great worship music here. It's not in the teaching. The greatest opportunity that the church has to unite the world is through love. Do you care if I take a rabbit trail for just a second? I'm going to take a rabbit trail, and this may be stinging. This may be a little harsh. And I don't want it to be harsh, because that's not what I'm going for. You see, I don't believe that you will ever be able to give the world what they need until you're able to give your family what you need. You will never be able to give the world what you are not able to give your own family. And here's what I mean by that. We get really caught up into going, Matthew 28, 20, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And sometimes in an attempt to fulfill Matthew 28, we bypass our own families. Don't treat the world better than you treat your husband. Don't treat the world better than you treat your wife. Don't treat the world better than you treat your brothers and your sisters and your kids. That sometimes we're willing to go across the city, but we're not willing to go across the living room to our kids' rooms and just knock on it and just say, hey, I love you. Dan has this saying. He says, build a bridge and get over it, right? I'm going to change that for just tonight. For heaven's sake, rebuild the bridges. 
I'll try it on this side of the room, as Dan would say. <laughs> For heaven's sake, rebuild the bridges. We cut these things off, and it's like, good riddance. I'm going to go on and live Jesus over here and forget about the situation I have with my parents, the situation that I have with my husband, the situation that I have with my wife. And if we can't be Jesus-loving people to our own family, how will we be Jesus-loving people to the world in which we live? You see, I get the whole idea why people who don't know Jesus treat other people badly. They don't know Jesus. Right? They don't know Jesus. But people that know Jesus have a responsibility to Jesus. Rebuild the bridges. Point number three. For heaven's sake, only the Spirit of God has the power to unite us. For heaven's sake, the Spirit of God has the power to unite us. Verse 3, always keep yourselves united in the Holy Spirit and bind yourself together in peace. We are all one body. We have the same Spirit. We have been called to the same glorious future. There is only one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And there is only one God and Father who is over us all and in us all and living through us all. You see, I believe that the greatest division between men does not lie in the color of a man's skin or the creed of a man's doctrine. The greatest division between men lies within their hearts. Because if you check out Acts chapter 2, verses 43 through 47, let me read it to you. Check out what was happening. When people were giving their life to Christ and the church was growing at a phenomenal rate, this is what was going on. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the, apo the apostles performed many mir miraculous signs and wonders, and all the believers met together. They constantly, constantly, and shared everything they had. They sold their possessions and shared the proceeds with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared meals with great joy and generosity all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their group those who were being saved. Here's what happened. They got in each other's stuff. We need people who love each other to get, love each other enough to get in each other's stuff. We need people who love each other enough to say, you know what, you need to come to my house for dinner. You know, when you start inviting people into your life, they're going to find out things about you that you maybe didn't want them to know. <laughs> and you're going to find out things about them that you maybe didn't want to know. You're going to be like, oh, geez, they are screwed up. We're having them over again? What are you doing? And guess what's going to happen with that? When you're going through your stuff, they're going to be there for you. When they're going through their stuff, they're going to, you're going to be there for them. And we're going to grow and we're going to add to each other's numbers daily. You need to know what my goal is for Canyon View Vineyard Church. Even though I have this little tiny office in the corner. And some people don't even know I'm here. <laughs> my goal is that Canyon View Vineyard Church would be a church where the city of Grand Junction is united to us because of our love. where people from every walk of life would, when they walk through those doors, know that there's going to be people here that love them in spite of who they are. That straight people come through here and find love. That people that are struggling with homosexuality and sexual sins come through here and find people who love them. That people who are rich and people who are poor, that Muslims, Catholics, atheists, all know that the people of this church love them for who they are and where they're at. Mother Teresa said these words. I'm reading a great book by Mother Teresa right now. She said, if you want the world to be aware of Jesus, you must first be convinced. Do you want to know if, how you know if you're convinced of Jesus? How do you live? 
Do you live like Jesus? Do you love like Jesus? I believe the greatest testimony of the church are when the sick are made whole. That when you walk into a church, I, I, my dad gave his life to Christ in, I think, 1964. He was an alcoholic. He was an oil-filled guy and all the things that went with that. And when he walked through the church, the pastor said, oh my gosh, the walls are going to fall in today. <laughs> but they didn't. And he came to know Christ. And some of you guys know him. He's a great guy. But he can't, had to come to a church that loved him the way he was. The greatest testimony of a church is a church that when the sick walk through, they become whole because of the relationship to Christ. And the whole people in the church love the sick people coming in. That's the greatest testimony of a church right there. You see, I believe that for heaven's sake, that we are called to use the gifts that God has given us. For heaven's sake, use the gifts that God has given you. You see, you have two responsibilities in this life. The first is to accept God. The second is to use the gifts that he's given you. That if God has given you gifts, if you are a really great mechanic, then use that gift to help those people around you. If you're a great accountant, then I believe that you have a responsibility to help people understand the ways of money and how they affect your life and how you, you can use that to affect other people's life. Whatever your job, whatever your skill, if you're a great mom, then you should love your kids in such a way that they come to know Jesus. I'm really impressed. My friends today, Jackie and Mark Nashia, they hosted an event down here for, combined with doctors and nurses, they had a health screening. They just said, we want to use our gift. 26 medical people came out to give free service to people in our community, all in the name of reaching our city for Jesus. They screened 55 people. One person, their blood pressure was so high that they were in danger of having a heart attack. Possibly saved their life. That is using your gift in such a way that you impact the city. You see, you don't have to have a lot to give a lot. In Mark chapter 12, there's a story, and it's called the widow's offering. And what happened was Jesus was teaching in the temple, and he was standing back after he was done teaching, and he looked across, and he saw people beginning to come in, and they began to give their offering. And the disciples are watching this, and the disciples are actually making comments like, dude, did you see how much money they just gave? That dude is loaded. Let's invite him into our uh, twelve. Let's, let's see if we can, you know, get some revenue going on here. And they're watching this thing, and, and Jesus is saying, you guys don't have the right perspective on this. And this little widow walks up, and then she gives what is equivalent to two pennies. And Jesus said, who gave the most? The disciples are going, well, that guy did. He's an accountant. Or that guy did because he, he owns the local market. And Jesus said, no, she did because she gave all she had. You see, you don't have to have a lot to give a lot. God's not impressed by what you have, number one. And two, God's not impressed by what you give. God is impressed by what you give of what you have. Amen? So the last thing I want you to write down is just simply this. If we're going to be united... For heaven's sake, stop measuring yourself against others. Stop measuring yourself against others. You see, this is really interesting. When you and I get to heaven, Jesus is not going to measure you or I against other people. He's not. Do you know what he's going to measure us against? Himself. Jesus versus you. Now there's an encouraging thought. <laughs> it's going to be like, oh, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy. His compassion versus your compassion. His forgiveness versus your forgiveness. His obedience versus your obedience. 
You see, stop measuring yourself against others. God needs you to be the person He created you to be. The world needs you to be the person that God created you to be. And when we start comparing ourselves to others, it's only because, it's only because that we're not sure who we are and who we're supposed to be. Ephesians 4, until we come to such unity in our faith and knowledge, God's Son, that we will be mature and full grown in the Lord. That's the goal, that we would become mature and full grown in the Lord. Measuring up to the full stature of Christ. People compare themselves to others so they won't have to face the reality of who they are. Right? That's why we compare ourselves to others. And we never compare ourselves to people who are doing better than us in life. It's always like, oh, geez, it stink to be those guys. Their life is really falling apart. Oh, but we got it together here. Yeah, it's all good. We never compare ourselves to people who are doing worse. We, I mean, better, only worse. Romans 12, 16 says, live in harmony with each other. Don't try to act more important, but enjoy the company of ordinary people. Who are ordinary people? We are. We're all ordinary people. And I believe this. I believe that the church will never gain unity until it gains transparency. You see, too many times we walk out those doors and we act like we're better than our neighbors because they throw wild parties. Their kids are pregnant. How are we going to win people to the Lord with those kind of attitudes? The church will never gain unity until it gains transparency. The church will never gain transparency until it comes face to face with God. I'm going to burst your bubble for just a second, okay? Since I already did it once, I'm going to do it again. You know what happens when you come face to face with God? You realize two things. That in the grand scheme of things, you are nothing. And that all the things that you work so hard to get, that you slave away at, are also nothing. The greatest gift you can give to this world is the gift of loving and serving your neighbor. I'm going to ask the worship team to come on back up. And as they come back up, I would like for you to stick with me for about another two or three minutes. Do you know why it's so important to have transparency? Do you know why it's so important for the church to be transparent? And for you to just look across at your buddy and say, man, I have problems too. Because when people see transparent people who love God with all their heart, all of a sudden they believe that that God loves them. People who were addicts find strength from people who love them. That people who go through divorce and the devastations that it has upon families need people who love them with genuine love. Without the Holy Spirit, I believe that we become people who are genuinely bitter and angry about the way that life has dealt us. You see, there's another thing that Mother Teresa said that just changed me. It was like, oh. You see, transparency is the sign of humility. But to gain humility, one must be humiliated and broken. You learn humility only by accepting humiliations. Who do you love? Who do you forgive? Who do you accept? Who do you show mercy to? Who have you invited to know Jesus? You see, the world does not lack resources. It lacks people who are compassionate. As we sing this last song, I'd really like for you to just kind of look inwardly. But I really want you to look inwardly at two things. And I want to urge you in these two things. What are you doing with Jesus? And what are you doing with the gifts that God has given you?
Because you are the salt of the earth, a city on a hill. The world needs people who are madly, deeply in love with Jesus and his ways. Let's worship.